As I mentioned in our first video lecture for this chapter, cellulose is another important polysaccharide made up of thousands of glucose molecules linked together in a 1-4 bonding pattern, similar to amylose. In contrast with amylose and amylopectin, however, cellulose's branching pattern is all beta. So you can see this uh, anomeric oxygen here is cis to the CH2OHs. Because they're cis to each other, they are all beta. This places this anomeric oxygen equatorial relative to the ring. Now because cellulose has this beta branching pattern, <clears throat> Individual molecules of cellulose are able to sit and stack more tightly on top of each other than amylose or amylopectin. This gives cellulose greater rigidity and strength than starch. And that's why nature uses cellulose to provide strength, rigidity, and structure to plants. One interesting fact that you should know is that all mammals have the enzymes necessary to break one for alpha linkages in sugar polymers. However, we do not have the enzyme that breaks 1,4 beta linkages. That's why we mammals can obtain the glucose that we need by eating starch in our diets, because we have the enzymes necessary to break those alpha linkages. But we do not have the enzyme necessary to break beta linkages present in cellulose. That's why we cannot obtain the glucose that we need by eating cellulose. Think about it. When was the last time that you got any nutrition from eating a newspaper? You didn't, because you don't have the enzymes to do it. Now you should know that bacteria do possess the enzyme necessary to break 1,4 beta linkages in cellulose. Grazing animals like cows and horses have these bacteria in their digestive tracts, which is why they're able to obtain the glucose they need by eating grass, which is made up almost completely of cellulose. Also, termites have bacteria in their digestive tracts that also enable them to obtain glucose by eating wood, which is also made up heavily of cellulose. One question that might elicit wonder and amazement is, why do people have different blood types? And what really causes this difference? Be prepared to be dazzled. And by dazzled, I mean bored, because I am about to tell you. You see, polysaccharides are extremely important in helping our cells communicate with each other. Nearly all of our cells' phospholipid membranes are coated with various sugar polymers that facilitate intercellular communication. Our blood cells' surfaces are coated with polysaccharides that allow them to communicate with each other. The differences between the four human blood types, which are A, B, AB, and O, are caused by our blood cell surfaces being coated with different polysaccharides. So a person who has blood type A has blood cells that are coated with this particular pattern of polysaccharides an acetylglucosamine attached to the phospholipid membrane with D-glucose bounded to L-fucose and then this N-acetyl-D-galactosamine dangling off of it. People who have type B blood have this polysaccharide pattern coming off of their surface. People who have type AB blood actually have mixtures of both type A and type B together. People with type O blood do not have the N-acetyl-D-galactosamine or D-galactose dangling off of it. All they have is this sugar pattern coming off of the surface of their blood cells. This is really interesting because you'll notice that anyone who has type AB blood has cells that are coated with all the stuff that you see in type A and all the stuff that you see in type B. That means that someone who has type AB blood is a universal acceptor. So they can be uh, receive blood from someone with type A and their blood cells will recognize this type of sugar on uh, the surface of their blood cells. They can receive blood from people of type B and be just fine as well because people with type AB blood have both type A and type B sugar uh, patterns on the surfaces of their cells. Type O lacks these extra 
uh, appendages dangling off of them, which means that type O can donate to anyone. Anyone who has type A or type B can accept type O, because type O has the exact same internal structure as type A and type B. Unfortunately, type O can only receive from type O. If you tried to give type A to a person with type O blood, the person with type O blood, their bodies would see this extra N-acetyl-D-galactosamine as a foreign invader and would not accept it. Similar would occur with type B. So once again, that explains why someone who has type AB blood is a universal acceptor, and someone who has type O blood is a universal donor. I now want to just tell you a story of synthetic sweeteners, because I think it's really interesting. But I'm probably not going to ask you any soul-searching questions about them, them on exams or quizzes. For a molecule to taste sweet, it has to bind to receptor found on a taste bud in the cells of our tongues, which then sends a nervous signal to our brain that registers that molecule as being sweet. Uh, believe it or not, different sugars actually differ in their level of sweetness. Compared with the sweetness of glucose, which is assigned a sweetness value of 1.0, sucrose's sweetness value is 1.45. Fructose is even higher, 1.65, which explains why we frequently see high fructose corn syrup being used as a sweetening agent in foods. Now here are several synthetic sweeteners that you can see. Interestingly, with the exception of sucralose shown here, none of them really have carbohydrate structures. Saccharin over here, which is also known as sweet and low, and was, was the first synthetic sweetener to be discovered. It's about 300 times sweeter than glucose and has very few calories. Dulcin, shown here, is a synthetic sweetener discovered a little bit later. It has the advantage over saccharin of not possessing the bitter metallic aftertaste. However, it was later banned because of toxicity. Uh, sodium cyclamate down here is another synthetic sweetener that was also later banned in the U.S. because it was found that large amounts of it cause liver cancer in mice. Aspartame right here, which is also known as NutraSweet, is about 200 times sweeter than sucrose and was approved by the FDA back in 1981. You know, I actually remember as a kid when NutraSweet gradually began to gain popularity and was being propagated through intense advertising campaigns for diet sodas and a number of other things. I actually remember that. NutraSweet was new and everyone thought it was just really exciting. And, and now it's slightly old news, but we still use it a lot. Now, acesulfame potassium right here was approved in 1988. It's about 200 times sweeter than glucose, has less aftertaste than saccharin, and is more stable than NutraSweet at high temperatures. Now, sucralose down here, which is also known as Splenda, among other names, is 600 times sweeter than glucose, and was just approved back in 1991. It maintains sweetness after longer uh, storage periods and can be used at high baking temperatures. It's made by selectively replacing three of sucrose's OH groups with chlorines. The body doesn't recognize sucralose as a carbohydrate, so it gets eliminated from the body unchanged. Hence, we can uh, eat sucralose. It tastes sweet and not uh, gain all of the caloric intake that we would from traditional carbohydrates. Well, that ends my lecture for this chapter. Thank you guys for hanging in there and listening to all of this. I realized that I didn't have as many funny stories or personal anecdotes uh, in this uh, section, and I'm sorry that it might have been a little bit more boring. But don't worry. I promise to make amends for that in our later chapter lectures, which you hopefully will enjoy. I'll see you then.